Did you know altitude is not measured from the Earth's surface below? And did you know that flying above an ocean at 36,000 feet and flying above huge mountains at 36,000 feet is basically the same? Watch this video and find out how this is possible. Before further investigating the subject, we must first understand how an airplane altimeter works. As you may guess, the altimeter is a pretty damn important instrument. It measures the aircraft's altitude above a specific reference point. Basically, an altimeter is a thing called a barometer, measuring the air pressure and converting it into altitude readings. Let's look at a couple of scientific facts about air pressure. Air pressure is not constant. If you've ever seen the weather forecast on TV, that weather girl or guy may have been explaining a high pressure or a low pressure area moving into the neighborhood. You could almost put this invisible layer on top of the map. The layer would have peaks and pits showing the different air pressure areas. Air pressure drops as you go higher and increases when you go lower. That's why some crazy people climbing Mount Everest must wear oxygen masks. The lower air pressure high in the mountains would otherwise make them pass out. This is why the safety demonstration on your flight always mentions that phrase, if the air pressure in the aircraft drops, air mass will automatically drop from the cabin above. There are a couple of ways to indicate the air pressure. For example, in your car tires, it's usually bars or PSI. In the US, there's an inch of mercury, but the most common universal unit is hectopascal. On average, when altitude changes by 30 feet, the air pressure changes by one hectopascal. So some scientists back in the day figured all this out and devised an idea to use it in airplanes to see how high they're going. And it was actually a perfect invention since it's still used in all modern aircraft today. If you've seen our video about METAR already, then you already know that the QNH is an essential piece of information that pilots need. Without the correct Q&H setting in the aircraft altimeter, the flight faces a massive risk of crashing into the ground before the runway on final approach. And what is Q&H exactly? What does it mean? Since aviation has so many weird abbreviations and acronyms, what does Q&H stand for? Well, actually, it doesn't stand for anything. It's just one of those Q codes used in aviation. Check out the link in the description for a list of all the existing Q codes. Nevertheless, QNH is one of the most critical abbreviations for flying. QNH is the air pressure setting on a particular area, for example, an airport measured from the mean sea level of that area. In other words, not from the airport ground level, but the average sea level on that particular spot. If you go and sit inside any parked aircraft cockpit, somewhere in front of you there's a switch where you can set the correct QNH value. Since most airports around the world are above sea level, the altimeter would then show how high from the sea level your aircraft is when it's on the ground. This is called the airfield elevation. After inserting the correct Q&H setting and returning to the cockpit the next day, the altimeter would probably show something different. Why? Because the air pressure outside has changed. That's why ensuring that this Q&H setting is always correct before commencing any flights is important. But why won't you set air pressure to the altimeter to indicate zero when you're on the ground? That would seem more logical, right? As a matter of fact, this is technically possible. For this, you need another Q value called QFE. That is the air pressure setting measured from the ground level. When this value is correctly set to the altimeter, it will show that your flying vehicle is at zero feet. Then why not use this setting all the time then? The problem with this is that the surroundings of an airport are not flat. There may be hills, mountains, and so on, and using the QFE wouldn't give a good overall picture of how high or low the airplane is at all times. The benefit of the good old QNH is that it shows the altitude constantly from the same reference point, mean sea level, no matter the ground level bumps above. But let's return to the situation I mentioned at the beginning of the video. When the captain says that all of you on board, the flight is flying at an altitude of 36,000 feet. In aviation terms, this is shortened to a flight level of 360 since one flight level equals 100 feet. Every single flight flying above transition level is flying on flight levels. Did you get confused with the levels, altitudes, and elevations already? Allow me to explain. Now we know that when the aircraft is on the ground, they have airport's current air pressure, the QNH, set to the altimeter. Great. 
However, since the air pressure is not constant worldwide, airports in different locations may have different air pressure values. So when an aircraft flies high above the clouds for several hours, it would be incredibly annoying for the pilots to keep up with the pressure settings of all the airports they're passing by. And that's why they don't. To make both the pilots and air traffic controllers lives easier, there is this magical invisible layer called the transition altitude. When any flight departs from an airport and climbs through this transition altitude, they all change their altimeter setting from local QNH value to a standard ICAO defined number of 1013 hectopascals. In other words, every flight high up in the sky uses the same air pressure setting, no matter what the actual air pressure is down on the Earth's surface at that point. When combining this fact with the other fact that the actual air pressure on Earth's surface changes daily, when you see an aircraft passing by, on some days the airplane is actually a bit lower than during other days, even though the flight has chosen to fly both times at the same flight level 360. Then how does the pilot know where this magical transition level exists? The easiest hint for the pilot is when the aircraft takes off and the controller no longer issues instructions to climb any altitude but instead starts using the term flight level. So when the controller says climb to altitude 5000 feet, this is below the transition altitude. When they say climb to flight level 70, that is above the transition altitude. As simple as that. This whole thing works the other way around as well. When the aircraft has been flying around the past 10 hours with the same standard pressure setting, 1013 hectopascals in the altimeter, something has to be done before reaching the destination airport. Because the actual pressure may be completely different there, right? The local QNH value as we have learned. And when does the pilot do this? When going down, another magical invisible boundary is called the transition level. Works the same way as when the aircraft is climbing. When the controller issues instructions for the pilot to descend to a lower flight level, we're still above the transition level. But as soon as the controller stops using the words flight level, for example, descend to altitude 5000 feet, that's the sign for the pilot to start using Q&H value since, oh boy, they are going through this transition level. But are the transition altitude and transition level the same thing? Good question. It depends on the country. In some places, those may be the same, in some they're different, but they are still fixed numbers. For example, the transition altitude is 13,000 feet, and the transition level is flight level 150. The most complex scenario is that the altitude is a fixed number, for example, 5,000 feet, and the transition level changes based on the local QNH values. Some days it may be flight level 40, on another it may be flight level 60. When the transition altitude and transition level are not the same, it creates the transition layer, the airspace between these two boundaries. This is a no-go area, a twilight zone, where no pilot shall ever go. Since the flights climbing up have already set the standard pressure value to their altimeters when entering the transition layer, the descending flights have started using the local QNH value. Maintaining a level of flight in this layer is just asking for trouble. You could be really close to another flight above or below you. And why is that? Let's say flight A is, for example, at flight level 70, and another one below flight B is at 6,000 feet. There is the required 1,000 feet minimum safe distance in between, right? Not necessarily. Check this out. As usual, the flight at flight level 70 has the standard 1,013 hectopascals in its altimeter. The flight at 6,000 feet has the local QNH, which may get tricky here. If the local QNH happens to be exactly 1,013 like the standard pressure, this would be the only situation where the distance between the flights is 1,000 feet. Usually this is not the case. The QNH can be something totally different. Let's say that in this example, the area is under low pressure, for example, 998 hectopascals. The reference pressure setting for flight A is 1,013 hectopascals, and for flight B, it's 998 hectopascals. Since we know that the air pressure drops the higher we go, flight B's reference pressure is higher than flight A's reference, even though the flight itself is lower. 
The difference between the standard pressure and QNH is 15 hectopascals, and because a change of 1 hectopascal in pressure equals roughly 30 feet in altitude, this results in a total of 450 feet and a change in altitude with this pressure difference. And since Flight B's reference is higher, we have to subtract the 450 feet from the assumed 1,000 feet minimum distance. So instead of 1,000 feet, there's only 550 feet of altitude in between them. So beware, low pressures can be extremely dangerous. Here's another example from a live ATC environment that controllers must deal with daily, military firing ranges versus flights. As you might have guessed, flying bullets don't mix well with airplanes. Keeping those two from each other is a critical task for an air traffic controller. Sometimes, the safety altitudes of the ranges can be really high. So high that in aviation terms, they would have to be indicated as flight levels. But usually, the military uses only feet when expressing the altitude of how high the bullets may fly. And then there are, of course, the planes that naturally want to use the flight levels. On that upper boundary of the military area, we have to ensure the lowest possible flight level that can still be safely used when the firing activity is going on below the flight. Let's say that the military says that their firing range safety altitude is 10,000 feet. For standard separation from any dangerous activity, we would need the 1,000 foot buffer again. If QNH was the standard 1,013 hectopascals, this would be easy peasy. Flight level 110 equals 11,000 feet, which would do the trick. But as we saw in the previous example, the low pressures start causing us headaches. Let's use the QNH value of 995 hectopascals as an example. Again, when the reference is lower pressure than the standard 1013, it's represented to be higher in the atmosphere since pressures drop when going higher. 1013 minus 995 equals 18. 18 times 30 equals 540 feet. This means the military range upper limit of 10,000 feet is 10,540 feet with a local QNH value of 995 hectopascals. Therefore, we should not let anyone fly above the firing range lower than the flight level 120. This makes the vertical distance between the aircraft and the firing range upper limit 1,460 feet, now more than the required 1,000 feet minimum distance. There you go, a comprehensive guide to the mysterious Q codes QNH and QFE, the standard pressure and the transition altitudes. We hope that you learned something from this video. Let us know in the comment section below if you want something to be explained further. And make sure to subscribe to Live and Let Fly for more aviation content.